Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Alam Usbah, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Faculty of Medicine, Mansoura University. The topic of my lecture today about vulvar cancer. So what we wanted to discuss today, the anatomical site of the vulva and lymphatic drainage, epidemiology of vulval cancer, histopathology, how to diagnose, staging, management, and lastly, the prognosis. Let us start with the anatomic side of the vulva. Look to this picture, please, the vulva, starting from the moon's pubis here, then post labia majora on both sides. The inner lips here is the labia minora. Clitoris in the midline here, the glands of the clitoris. Then the vestibule, which when you open the uh, separate, the labia minora, you will see the vestibule, rectangular in shape. Two opening open in the vestibule, the external visceral meatus and the vaginal opening, and the two ducts of the parsolin glands opening on both sides, one duct on each side. And lastly here, the perineum. This is the vulva. As you see, the arterial supply from internal pudendal artery mainly, and to less extent, the external pudendal artery. The nervous supply by ilioinguinal and genitive femoral nerve for the anterior part of the vulva, while the posterior part receive innervation from the posterior cutaneous nerve. What about lymphatic drainage? Lymphatic drainage via inguinal lymph nodes, as you see in the picture, the superficial and the deep. This is the superficial, and this is the deep inguinal lymph node. The clitoris and the anterior labia drain directly to the deep inguinal and the internal iliac lymph nodes. That's why when there is malignancy in the clitoral region or the anterior labia, maybe lymphatic spread is more hazardous because it gives direct transmission to the deep inguinal or internal iliac lymph nodes. So what about the superficial and the deep inguinal lymph nodes? The superficial located beneath the cumbar fascia, as you see in the picture, and the superficial to the fascia later. So it is beneath the cumbar fascia and the superficial to fascia later. This is the superficial inguinal lymph nodes. Consists of four to 25 lymph nodes. These lymph nodes empty mainly into the external iliac lymph nodes and the deep inguinal. Superficial inguinal lymph nodes can be divided into five groups based on determination of the great softness vein into superior medial, superior lateral, inframedial, inferolateral, and the central. What about the deep inguinal lymph nodes? Lie beneath the fascia later along the femoral vein, approximately one to three. Deep inguinal nodes drain the glands of the clitoris and receive drainage from the superficial inguinal lymph nodes. And this lymphatic vessel traveling along the femoral artery, the deep inguinal nodes empty into the obturator, medial or external iliac lymph nodes. Location of these nodes are as follows, distal to the saponofemoral junction or within the femoral canal and lateral to the femoral ring as you see in this picture this is the femoral canal this is the femoral ring okay the lymph nodes located within the femoral canal is called cloquet node and is thought to be the link between inguinal and the iliac and the obturator lymph nodes what is the epidemiology of vulval cancer? Vulval cancer account for about 4% of cancer of the female genital system in the United States. So, 
It is less common than other gynecologic malignancy, which include uterine cancer, ovarian, and cervical cancer. Vulval cancer is most commonly diagnosed at ages 65 to 74. The median age around 69 years, and the squamous cell carcinoma is the most common five, 90 percent. Melanoma constitute 5% and considered the second most common vulval malignancy. About the race, mostly or more common in white race around the age 50 to 70, 60% of diagnoses are localized and uh, has 85% in case of five year survival rate. The risk factor including old age, infection with human papilloma virus, lichen sclerosis, precancerous lesion, which is vulval intraabserial neoplasia, low grade and high grade, smoking, inflammatory condition of the vulva, period pelvic radiation and the immune deficiency, inflammatory conditions of the vulva, especially if it is chronic. The histopathology include different types. The commonest is the squamous cell carcinoma. The other types include basal cell carcinoma, melanoma, Paget's disease, verrucous carcinoma, sarcoma, parcelling gland, and other adenocarcinoma. What about squamous cell carcinoma? In this picture, this is squamous cell carcinoma. We said that it is the commonest histologic type of vulval cancer, and it can be categorized into three types or subtypes, warty, basaloid, and keratinizing. What is the difference between warty and basaloid and the keratinizing subtype? The category of warty and basaloid is found mostly in patient age 40 to 44 years. It's associated with human papilloma virus infection account for 20 to 35 percent of vulval squamous cell carcinoma. While the keratinizing subtype is associated with older postmenopausal women, we can consider it human papilloma virus independent, not like the wart and resoloid subtype, which is human papilloma virus dependent. Also, the, the keratinizing subtype account for 60 to 80 percent of all squamous cell carcinoma may occur anywhere in the vulva, but the most common site is the labia majora and perineum. What is the precursor for squamous cell carcinoma is vulval intraabserial neoplasia, and we have recently two categories: human papilloma virus dependent usual type. That's why we call it UVIN. And the human papilloma virus independent differentiated type, and we call it DVIN. In 2014, WHO classified vulval tumor, squamous intraabyssinal lesion of the vulva, low grade type, high grade type, and differentiated VIN. What about the difference between usual VIM and differentiated VIM? The usual VIM, human papilloma virus dependent, more commonly seen in basaloid or warty's human cell carcinoma. Risk factor includes smoking, immune suppression, sexual practices. It is less likely to progress to squamous cell carcinoma than the differentiated VIN. Usual type VIN well progressed to invasive squamous cell carcinoma in only 5% of cases, but is responsible for 40% of all vulvar squamous cell carcinoma. A 50 younger age patient than the differentiated type is usually B16 positive and B53 negative on immunohistochemistry. On the other side, the differentiated VIN is considered human papilloma virus 
independent differentiated type typically progress to keratinized squamous cell carcinoma arise mostly from chronic dermatosis like lichen sclerosis and lichen planus make up only 5% of pre-invasive vulvar lesion has a higher rate of malignant transformation than the usual BIN and is identified as a precursor in approximately 35% of vulvar squamous cell carcinoma affecting older patients above 60 is usually P16 negative and B53 positive in immunohistochemistry. chemistry. Be careful that the patient with lichen sclerosis need lifelong monitoring. Why? Due to risk of eventually developing vulvar squamous cell carcinoma, increasing the duration of disease. I mean, while it is 1% at two years with lichen sclerosis, it reaches up to 37% at 25 years with the disease. So the prolonged time of the disease carry a higher risk of malignancy. What about basal cell carcinoma, another histological type of vulval cancer, which is relatively rare, diagnosed in only 8% of vulval malignancy. Diagnosis is usually made in the seventh or eighth decade, most commonly with Libia majora and the vulval pruritus lesion. Most visit cell carcinoma is of nodular subtype, with the superficial subtype being the second most common. As you see in the picture, this is the basal cell carcinoma. Dermoscopy diagnostic of basal cell carcinoma reveals arborizing vessels, glandectasia, no avoid nests, no globules, and the white shiny structures. Imaging studies are only needed for extensive local disease, suspicious for underlying structural destruction and invasion. Treatment mainly complete excision with negative margins. Basal cell carcinoma in the genital area is high risk for recurrence. However, the prognosis of vulval basal cell carcinoma is favorable, and the overall survival is unaffected by the lesion size. What about the Baget's disease? Actually, extra mammary Baget's disease is rare skin malignancy, affecting the apocrine gland bearing skin with 56% of all cases occurring in the vulva. But Baget's disease constitutes 1-2% to of all vulval malignancy. The disease occurs primarily in Caucasian women in their sex to seventh decade of life, and the presenting symptom is pruritus uh, in up to 72% of cases. Also, Baget's disease can be categorized as a primary or secondary. The primary is an intraepithelial adenocarcinoma with Baget cells that arise within the epidermis and extends into the epithelium of adjacent skin appendages. The disease can become luckily invasive when Baget cell breaks through the basement membrane and infiltrate deeper tissue layers. What about secondary vulvar, vulvar Baget disease? It occurs less frequently but is associated with epidermotropic metastasis or direct invasion of an occult adenocarcinoma, immunohistochemical markers more prevalent in secondary Baget's disease. In this picture, this is the Baget's disease. The non-invasive vulvar Baget's disease is associated with underlying adenocarcinoma in 4 to 17 percent of patients. Histologically, Baget cells are epithelial tumor cell with clear cytoplasm. This can either heterogeneously invade the epidermis or spread in a nest-like fashion. Immunohistochemical markers of vulvar Baget's disease include cytokeratin-7 and other markers, 
which is more prevalent in secondary vulvar Paget's disease and can help differentiate primary from secondary. Vulvar Paget's lesions can be slow growing for many years, but after invasion through the dermis the spread can be rapid and aggressive by lymphatics or metogenous root. The next extension is frequent, occurring in up to 90%, reaching the hair follicles and the eccrine ducts, the most common. What about the vulvar melanoma? We have three types, the mucosal integus subtype, which is the commonest, followed by nodular and superficial spreading subtypes. Differ from cutaneous melanoma, where the superficial spreading subtype is the most common. But in vulval melanoma, mucosal lenticus subtype is the most common. Vulval and cutaneous melanoma share similar immune histochemistry markers, like S100B, HMD45, and the Milan A that differ significantly by mutational analysis. Vulvar melanoma more rarely exhibit FB's 600 BRAF mutations and up to 26% than mucosal melanoma. A wild mutation in cell regulatory proteins are significantly more common in vulvar melanoma. Approximate the 25 to 31 percent. This melanoma affecting the woman in the fifth to seventh decade of life. White women are more commonly affected with this lesion. The most common site in the vulva is the clitoris and labia minora. The best predictor for survival are the depths of invasion and the presence of lymphovascular space invasion. Surgical resection with adjuvant targeted medical therapy is currently recommended. What about verrucous carcinoma in this picture? The etiology of vulvar verrucous carcinoma is unknown and no precursor lesion to this disease have been described. An association with lichen simplex chronicus and the lichen sclerosis have been reported. Also, sometimes some studies evaluating an association with human papilloma virus status, but not brought yet. Histologically, Rucus carcinoma is well differentiated tumor with marked acanthotic epithelial proliferation and the minimal nuclear atevia. As you see in the picture, it can reach to a big size and take a take the picture of a cauliflower mass. The tumor expands with elongating gritty ridge that have become characteristic of this type of lesion. These elongating ridges will advance into the dermis, causing pushing rather than infiltrating the pattern. Proliferation occur primary at the basal and the parabasal layer. This is demonstrated by increased expression of cellular protein QI67, MCM2, and TOP2A. In contrast with squamous cell carcinoma, the rucous carcinoma doesn't have overexpression of B53. Appearance of this lesion is typically warty and they become quite large without the risk of metastasis. Although being this large cauliflower mass, the metastasis is very slow or low. The recommended treatment is lo local excision. What about sarcoma? It's a rare type of cancer of mesenchymal origin described in the setting of vulval cancer. The most common sarcoma of the vulva being leomyosarcoma, 
followed by dermatofibrosarcoma, protuberance, glycidioid sarcoma, malignant fibrohistrocytoma, and synovial sarcoma. Synovial sarcoma are further divided into monophasic, biphasic, and undifferentiated histological type. The monophasic contain only spindle cell, biphasic contain both epithelial and spindle cell types, while the undifferentiated share characteristics of both. Sarcoma are slow-growing tumor, most commonly of the clitoris and the libia minora, have younger age at diagnosis, median age 41 years, rare lymph node invasion, dermatofibrocytoma, protuberance, median age at diagnosis is 45 years old, and is related to translocation leading to tyrosine kinase disinhibition and this presents a possible use of ty for tyrosine kinase inhibitors in the management of subtype of vulvar sarcoma. Vulvar epithelioid sarcoma is diagnosed at the youngest mean age 31 years and tend to exclude the lowest survival of all vulval cancer. What about the parcel gland and the other adenocarcinoma? The parcel gland, the primary cancer, is exceedingly rare and arises from either the gland or the duct. Presentation is usually the grass of bellus mass in the labia majora during the fifth to sixth decades of life. Cancer of the parcel gland most commonly exhibits either squamous cell carcinoma or adenocarcinoma histologic subtypes. What about the clinical presentation of vulval cancer? History of vulvar illness, like the patient may complain long history of pruritus and irritation, dysuria, pain, discharge, valvular mass, which is increasing in size, maybe bleeding from this mass, and also patient may be asymptomatic and discovered accidentally during local examination for any reason. Most patients with vulvar melanoma presented with advanced symptoms of bleeding, mass, ulceration, in 25% of vulvar melanoma, you will be surprised that they are amelanotic, which make it make the diagnosis difficult in many patients. Vulvar Baget's disease can have a very non-specific presentation that may may cause confusion at diagnosis. And also the diagnosis usually delayed by median of two years, typically after topical steroid or antifungal are filled. So the doctor prescribes steroid or antifungal for this disease because he cannot reach the actual diagnosis. Parcelling gland carcinoma presents non-specifically as painless visible mass and is often misdiagnosed and incorrectly treated as an abscess or cyst superior to a definitive diagnosis. So take care, not all parcel gland mass is considered cyst or abscess, maybe parcel gland carcinoma, although it is rare, but can happen. But take care that in case of Parcel gland carcinoma is painless mass. What about the physical examination? During local examination, you will see your symptoms lesions, scaly patch, ulcer, cauliflower mass, or ill defined mass, flakes. In case of vulvar melanoma, attention to a, B, C, D, E, rule. A for asymmetry. Look to this picture, please. A for asymmetry. B for border irregularity. 
C for color, D for diameter, and E for evolving. What is the investigation that may be needed? Any suspicious lesions warrant further investigation, including colposcopy of the vulva and the vagina and the biopsy. Biopsy is very important because the gold standard for diagnosis of vulvar cancer remains the histologic diagnosis. Any suspicious lesion should be biopsied and carefully examined. For its precise anatomical position, very important to know the anatomical position of the lesion in the vulva with respect to the midline and the distance from vaginal introitus or from midline. Because the lymphatic spirit and the decision for management of lymph node dissection may be affected by the side of the lesion and it's the distance between the lesion and the midline. Imaging studies may be indicated to evaluate the extent of the disease. Cystoscopy and the proctoscopy should be performed if there is suspicion of leather or rectal involvement. Paget's disease screening should be done for other malignancies including genitourinary, gastrointestinal, and the breast cancer, especially considering that the most common cause of secondary vulval Paget's disease is anorectal and uricellial adenocarcinoma. So take care about this. What is the differential diagnosis? This vulval lesion carry differential diagnosis of cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma and the cutaneous basal cell carcinoma and the melanoma, atopic dermatitis, psoriasis, lichen sclerosis, lichen blemis, lichen chron chronicus simplex, contact dermatitis, benfigus vegetans, candidiasis, mycosis, fungoids, and the other vulval lesions. The complication include either worsening of the complaint of the patient, which may be pain and other irritation, becomes more worse with time, or there is declining in the functional status as the malignancy spread and it begins to invade locally and regionally in the vagina, urethra, anal canal, or anal orifice, and so on, for causing complication. Or the complication may be related to the management, like surgery. Surgery may cause lymphedema, significant chronic pain, and other organ complication. Also, chemotherapy and radiotherapy may cause infection, multiple BIT reaction, tissue fibrosis, and the lymphedema also. What is the spread of vulval cancer? Please look to this picture. The spread may be direct to the adjacent structure like the vagina, urethra and the anus, kissing the ulcer, mirrors it from extension to the other side, ulcer on each side of the labia minora, for example, maybe due to direct extension or due to lymphatics, by the way, crossing to the other side, so you will see ulcer from the labia minora at the same side, okay, this is the direct, but lymphatic is very important, really, in vulval cancer. The majority of the vulva drain into superficial inguinal lymph nodes which drain or goes to the deep inguinal lymph nodes. But the anterior part of the labia and the clitoris can drain directly to the deep inguinal or internal iliac lymph nodes. That's why malignancy in this region Clitoral region and the anterior labia is more dangerous than the posterior. Or metastasis or spread through the blood, visible to liver, lung, and bone for distant metastasis. What about fugal staging? We have four stages 
page one a tumor less than two centimeter or equal to two centimeter with a stromal invasion either equal to or less than one millimeter while one b tumor more than two centimeter or stromal invasion more than one millimeter stage two tumor of any size with extension to adjacent Perineal structures, lower urethra, lower vagina, or anus. I mean the lower urethra, the lower third, and the lower third of the vagina, or anus. But no nodal metastasis. So up till now, there is lymph, no lymph node metastasis as regards stage 1 and 2. But in stage 3, there is node metastasis. Lymph node metastasis. Stage 3a, is a one node metastasis more than or equal to five millimeter or one to two node metastasis less than five millimeter 3b equal to or more than two node metastasis equal to or more than five millimeter or equal to or more three node metastasis less than five millimeter a while stage 3c node metastasis with extra capsular spread what about stage four? Stage four A tumor invade any of the following: the upper urethra and the upper vaginal mucosa, the bladder mucosa, the rectal mucosa, or fixed to the pelvic bone, or fixed or ulcerated in vino femoral nodes. So when you examine clinically, if you found positive in vino femoral lymph nodes ulcerated and defixed. This case is stage 4A, for example. Then stage 4B, any distant metastasis, including pelvic nodes. What is the treatment? Treatment of vulva cancer is mainly surgical excision, which is a standard therapy, adjuvant radiation and the chemotherapy, as in this picture may be recommended depending on the histopathology and the extent of the disease. So surgery at the main line and also adjuvant radiation and chemotherapy may be recommended. Surgery is the primary treatment in early stage, as you see in the picture. We can do either wide local incision or radical resection with margin extending to the perineal fascia and the inguinal lymph node assessment. As you see here, we are doing incision here around the vulva, reaching the perineal fascia. This is called the radical resection. The safe margin, one to two centimeter. And at the same moment, we are going to do, as in the upper picture here, groin this section, either on one side, ipsilateral or bilateral, for the section of the inguinal lymph node or we are going to do just wide local incision excision excision of the lesion and take care about the safe margin two centimeters depending on what depending on the stage of the disease has to pathology of the disease of the subtype of vulvar cancer the depth of invasion less than one millimeter or more than one millimeter so all these variable affecting my decision we are going to do wide local excision or radical resection with margin extending to the perineal fascia and the going lymph node assessment as you see in this picture this is a while doing it the incision excision of the vulval area here the sick margin then repair here as you see and in the upper picture, showing you the groin the section one side. By the way, in the past, the treatment of vulvar cancer as regards surgery was radical vulvectomy with butterfly incision, removing the whole vulva and the, reaching the perineal fascia and the, removing the, the lymph nodes, all of these in in one block in block is removed and also not only the inguinal lymph nodes also pelvic lymph nodes 
and this radical valvectomy surgery used in the past will carry very dangerous complication with morbidity and mortality, disruption of the wound and wound infection, and mortality from the surgery itself as from the complication of surgery itself is high. That's why it is no more used all over the world, replaced by the what I said right now, wide local oxygen or radical excision with groin dissection or three incision technique. So the surgery is the primary treatment of early stage disease. The rest of the carus is associated with the tumor size, lymph node involvement, and positive margin for squamous cell carcinoma with depth of vision less than one millimeter. Wide local excision without lymphadenectomy is sufficient. So you are doing conservative surgery. We are not in need for more radical surgery. Okay. For many reasons, to decrease the morbidity, for cosmetic reasons, for helping the repair of the wound. So from different points of view, this wide local Oxygen may be the best surgery to be done in this case with less than or equal to one millimeter invasion in this row. Okay. Of course, don't forget you are leaving surgical margin of one to two centimeters should be free from malignancy. If tumor depth is greater than one millimeter or tumor diameter exceed two centimeter, radical resection with margins extending to the perineal fascia and the inguinal lymph node assessment should be performed. But not like the past, the butterfly incision no more, butterfly incision no more removal in, in block, but take care we are doing more conservative surgery recently, okay? For verrucous carcinoma, local excision is typically sufficient. However, the advanced disease may require radical resection. Tumor-free margin decrease the risk of recurrence. Why in the verrucous carcinoma we say local excision is typically sufficient? We may not, we may not need any groin dissection or lymph node dissection because it is really to we have a lymphatic spread with verrucous carcinoma, even with larger sized tumor. Okay. For vulvar melanoma, wide local excision with tumor free margin. When I say tumor free margin, I mean two centimeters. It's also recommended for, for melanoma as cutaneous melanoma because radical surgery to treat vulvar melanoma doesn't improve survival and is associated with increased morbidity. What about Paget's disease? Local excision is a standard line of treatment. However, given that multifocal disease is common, high rate of positive margin and the recurrence are often observed. This is the problem of Paget's disease, the problem of positive margins and the pros and occurrence of recurrence. Okay? And because this disease is a multifocal, this is another problem. Inguinal lymphadenectomy should be considered if the invasion is greater than one millimeter. Most surgery, most surgery belong to Frederick North. And this operation is named on the owner of the surgeon who described it, which is uh, who, whom is uh, Frederick Moons. This surgery may benefit the successful resection of vegetoid lesions and has been associated with a higher rate of negative margin. It is performed by removing thin margin of tissue circumferentially around the deep around and the deep to the clinical margins of a skin tumor. 
It is then rapidly frozen and friction, allowing for quick tissue processing within 15 to 30 minutes. You can get the result of examination under the microscope. The process is repeated until the tumor has negative histologic mark. And this was surgery, replacing an old surgery called chemosurgery when they in inject zinc chloride inside the tumor. And then after the removal, they found if there is safe margin or not, then again repeat the removal and so on until reaching safe margin. But this is a more better and the more recent is to use it and to do frozen biopsy, take circumferential and the deeper biopsy and send for histopathology and delete it if there is safe margin or not yet so you can continue the operation until you reach the safe margin. This is most surgery belong to Frederick Moscow. In vulvar sarcoma, the standard treatment is radical local excision, as in the picture. What about staging lymphadenectomy? Evaluation of lymph nodes should be performed for vulvar cancer with depths of invasion more than one millimeter. So remember this, any depth of invasion more than one, one millimeter required staging lymphadenectomy. After drawing this section, 14 to 48 of vulvar cancer patients experience lymphedema. This is as a complication. Factors associated with risk of lymphedema include surgical procedure use, stage of the cancer, presence of wound infection, increased body mass index, adjuvant radiation or chemotherapy. So, staging lymphadenectomy is not an easy operation because, or a safe operation because it may be complicated by lymphedema. That's why the gynecologists think about sentinel lymph node pipes. If we can know this, the, the, the result of central lymph node biopsy, is it affected by the malignancy or not? And the, we did this section for central lymph node biopsy, which can be enough, no more this section in the groin for other lymph nodes, okay? As you see in the picture here, this is central lymph node mapping, is injecting the dye, and the fluorescent dye green dye can be seen here and the fluorescent is here and the dye can be seen here the central lymph node is the first to receive or drain the malignancy so i can know it by injecting this dye which pass through the lymphatic channel to the lymph nodes and i can know during the operation which one is the central lymph node i can take a biopsy and send for histopathology if it is affected or not, if it is positive or not. If positive, I can continue the pelvic lymphadenectomy. If negative, I can stop staging the lymphadenectomy, okay? Because it is negative. So, the aim of using sentinel lymph node biopsy or mapping is to decrease the unneeded section in the groin, in the groin area for a staging lymphadenic to avoid the complication which is lymphedema and the other complication of surgery. For vulvar squamous cell carcinoma, if a primary lesion is the unilateral greater than one centimeter from the vulvar midline, an epsilateral inguinal lymphadenectomy can be performed, as in this picture. An epsilon, if the lesion in the midline greater than one centimeter, sorry, 
greater one centimeter from the midline away from the midline more than one centimeter okay to one side so i do only unilateral staging lymphadenectomy or epsilateral on the same side lymphadenectomy okay but what if the lesion in the midline i should do bilateral lymphadenectomy so take care about this so if the lesion in the region more than one centimeter from the midline i can do epsilateral lymphadenectomy if it is less than one centimeter from the midline or in the midline itself as in clitoris, I, I should do i should do bilateral lymphadenectomy okay if technician 99 is combined with intraoperative blue dye the detection rate of sentinel lymph node reaching up to 100 percent in patient with unifocal tumor less than 4 cm and the clinically negative lymph nodes, central lymph node biopsy is recommended. For vulvar basal cell carcinoma, of course, lymph node biopsy not required. In patient with melanoma, central lymph node biopsy is recommended at the surgical resection of primary tumor. Bilateral versus unilateral lymph node assessment follow the squamous cell carcinoma criteria. For vulvar sarcoma, lymph node dissection should be reserved for cases in which lymph nodes are clinically positive. What about parcelling gland carcinoma? Treatment recommendations are similar to those of vulvar squamous cell carcinoma. In patients with verrucous carcinoma, lesions are locally invasive with reports of tumors up to 15 cm in size with little to no risk of lymph node metastasis. So, mostly in these cases, we are not in need for lymphadenectomy. Due to possible coexistence of squamous cell carcinoma with verrucous carcinoma, considerable differences in treatment life and adequately large and deep biopsy should be obtained to rule out concomitant disease. After exclusion of squamous cell carcinoma, routine lymph node dissection should be omitted for the rotus carcinoma. Let us go to the adjuvant radiation therapy. Radiation is recommended as adjuvant therapy for histologically confirmed metastatic disease and also can be used as a primary therapy for locally advanced disease followed by radical resection so sometimes after you are you do the surgery then you ask for radiotherapy for this patient okay so this is called adjuvant therapy but sometimes in advanced disease you may ask for radiotherapy as a primary treatment then do radical surgery after finishing the radiotherapy okay so radiotherapy could be adjuvant therapy and also in other cases could be a primary therapy when sentinel lymph node biopsy is positive it is acceptable to offer adjuvant radiation with or without chemotherapy or to perform complete inguinal lymphadenectomy and offer adjuvant therapy only if high risk features are identified, such as positive or closed resection margin, or multiple involved nodes, or multifocal disease, or extra capsular extension. The later approach is recommended, especially if there are equal to or, or more than two positive nodes, or one positive node with more than two millimeter metastasis. In case of locally advanced disease, primary chemo radiation is recommended, followed by radical resection in residual. In event of distant metastasis, treatment is palliative, primarily 
focused on improve the quality of life. In this case, chemo radiation can be used for symptomatic relief at the primary tumor site in Dolphins. What about vulvar melanoma? Radiotherapy has a limited benefit, and the use of new adjuvant radiotherapy has not been described. So don't describe radiotherapy for cases with vulvar melanoma because it is of limited benefit. The vulvar Baget's disease, radiotherapy or photodynamic therapy, as in this picture, photodynamic therapy, can be considered as an alternative treatment options to surgical resection. Photodynamic therapy is clinically approved. Minimally invasive procedure involved treatment with photosensitizing agents followed by irradiation and wavelengths corresponding to the absorbance and band of the sensitizer. Photodynamic therapy is an effective and safe alternative treatment more commonly used for BIM that preserves normal anatomy and sexual function without risk of disease progression. What about medical treatment? We finished surgical treatment, radiotherapy, and now we are in medical treatment. Medical treatment include platinum-based chemotherapeutic agents, which is commonly used. Another line of treatment Erlotinib, which is an anti-epidermal growth factor receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitor, used for vulvar squamous cell carcinoma. And the partial response was observed in 27% of patients, and an additional 40% exhibited stable disease, but the progression free survival was poor. Another line of treatment is semi glimap and BD1 blocker has undergone phase 2 trial in patients with locally advanced or metastatic venous stoma cell carcinoma that reported a 47% response rate of which more than half persisted greater than six months and it is currently approved to treat metastatic venous vulvar squamous cell carcinoma. Typical 5% amicumor free applied three times weekly for 16 weeks. If surgical excision of squamous cell carcinoma or basal cell carcinoma is contraindicated. Typical 5 fluoroacyl treatment with photodynamic therapy in basal cell carcinoma may be also considered. In patients with melanoma, medical management with novel treatment like CTLA-4, BD-1, BRAF, and MEK inhibitors such as nivolumab and ibilimumab has improved overall survival. These surveys are now considered first-line survey in patients with stage 3 disease, but limited data is available for the presence of vulval melanoma, for the response in vulval melanoma. One of the differences between cutaneous melanoma and vulval melanoma is the relatively high number of receptor tyrosine kinase, kinase proteins mutations. This creates the potential to explore tyrosine kinase inhibitor as a treatment for vulvar melanoma in future studies. Topical 5% emicumut cream for the treatment of the vulvar Baget's disease reported 75 response rate. And this is a good. What about the post-operative care? This patient needs, of course, post-operative care and should be followed closely after treatment for any complication as regards surgery or chemotherapy or radiotherapy, also for the possibility of recurrence of the disease. So, surveillance 
should be every three months for two years, then every six months for three years, and annually after work for five years. What about the prognosis of vulvar cancer? Lymphoid status is the most powerful prognostic factor for overall survival in patients with vulvar cancer. Survival rates are significantly lower for patients with lymph node metastasis. Progression-free survival is better in mood positive patients who receive adjuvant reducer. The recurrence rate of vulvar cancer is 37% at five years. Patients diagnosed with distant metastasis have poor prognosis. Vulvar melanoma prognosis is poor with an estimated five year survival between 10 to 63%. Patients with centrally located vulvar melanoma have reduced the survival rate and the short recurrence free curve. The average time to recurrence in vulvar melanoma is 43.5 months with an overall 50% recurrence rate. Baget's disease has a favorable prognosis despite frequent recurrence rate. In patients with vulvar Baget's disease and an underlying adenocarcinoma, the prognosis depends on the type and the treatment outcomes for the associated adenocarcinoma. Local recurrence of vulvar sarcoma is common. The most predictive factor for recurrence is inadequate resection margin and the tumor diameter greater than 5 mm. Infiltrating margin, another fact, and the high mitotic rate also. Parceling gland carcinoma is similar to vulvar squamous cell carcinoma in that prognosis is stage dependent. Human papilloma virus status is also relevant for prognosis as human papilloma virus positive vulvar cancer have more favorable outcomes than human papilloma virus negative and they may be exploited to allow for more conservative treatment and the post treatment follow up the current disease confined to the vulva can be successfully treated with surgical resection Patients with metastatic or locally aggressive recurrence of vulvar cancer have two year overall survival of only 57% after exenterative surgery. Thank you. This is the last slide. I'm Dr. Alam Sbah, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Faculty of Medicine, Mansoura University.